We have promised we are going to have a special program devoted to the late Bruce Hungerford, who was killed in an automobile accident on Wednesday, January 26th. We have in the studio today three people closely associated with Bruce Hungerford. They are Robert Lurie, Werner Eisler, and Gary Klein. Mr. Lurie is going to moderate the discussion. We'll be having some of the recordings of Bruce Hungerford as well. I'm Robert Lurie, and for many years I had the honor of producing, sometimes engineering and editing, the recordings of Mr. Hungerford. I also did much the same in his audiovisual presentations concerning Egypt, the series known as the Heritage of Ancient Egypt. And so I got to know him as a great friend since we had many common connections through music and a somewhat similar background along those lines, photography, travel, and many other things. It has been my good fortune to have studied with and worked with a considerable number of great artists here and in Europe. But Mr. Hungerford was unique even amongst all of those. He was really not a person of this century. Many people thought of him as a gentleman of the 19th century, somehow transported here with absolutely uncompromising goals and standards, sure and reliable and just extraordinary in many fashions. Now, we have with us Mr. Werner Eisler, who was perhaps his oldest friend in this country, and he'll explain to us how that came about. I don't know whether I'm really his oldest friend, but I have a feeling that I've probably known him as long as anyone here. The way it came about was that there was a lady who played chamber music with my father in Berlin before the war. And while our family came here to the United States, she emigrated to Australia. And about the time that I returned from military service in 1945, my parents had had a letter from her telling there was a young, promising artist had been awarded the scholarship to study at the graduate division of the Juilliard School. And he was going to be here any day. We subsequently heard from him and I went to meet him at a recital that he played at a church at 105th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in New York. And I particularly remember that of all the things that he's been publicly identified with subsequently, the strongest impression that remained with me was of all things the Liszt Six Hungarian Rhapsody, the one with those spectacular octaves at the end. And the impression was so strong that I've tended to judge every performance I've heard since by that impression. Well, we became friends. He was a frequent visitor to my parents' home, and we were in touch with one hiatus of about four years and formed a very close friendship, uh, both personally and with our families. So we have come to this close association which has now been so tragically broken off. How extraordinary that anybody should remember him for a list when the general public and those who have heard him play would think that that would be about the farthest away from the type of thing that Bruce had been playing these last years. Exactly, but he'd still show you how to do those octaves, right Gary? <laughs> That's right. Now, Gary is Gary Klein who was one of Bruce Hungerford's closest students and who has many insights on him and who will explain himself how that came about. I met Bruce Hungerford in 1972 when I came to the Manus School. And I've studied with him for approximately four and a half years. Mr. Hungerford was more than just a teacher. He was a tremendous guide to me, both personally, as a musician, spiritually, in almost any way you could imagine. A wonderful man who seemed to be able to get down to the basic humanity in everyone he met. He had this wonderful ability 
with his smile just to light up your whole being. Wonderful person to know. Well, we are primarily here to honor Bruce Hungerford as a musician. So perhaps it's a moment to hear some music. Now, despite the fact that I produced things for him for so many years, none of the things that you will hear today will be those that I produced. Because we are trying to present things that are not available commercially or have been deleted, hopefully to return soon. So we're going to start off with one of the earliest recordings that I have of him from 1953, made at the University of Illinois. Dame Myra Hess was there at that time, and he spoke to me very often of her passage there. We will hear two arrangements of works by Johann Sebastian Bach, the first being a chorale arranged by Walter Rummel, Mortify Us by Thy Grace, and that will be followed by Mr. Hungerford's own arrangement of the Sonatina from the Cantata number 106. Thank you. 
the influence of Myra Hess is strongly felt in this, as would be natural. Well, there's something else, Bob. Don't you remember how many times Bruce would talk to all of us and how he abhorred the use of the piano as a percussive instrument, how he would say that this is a musical instrument and it must sing. And these characteristics came out so very clearly here, and this is something that was typical of his playing all the time. And singing was typical all the time in any of his recordings, in any of his concerts, you would certainly hear the piano sing. Mm -hmm. And occasionally Bruce, too. That's right. <laughs> uh, sotto voce. Now uh, we are going to rapidly make a jump of some 23 years from one of his earliest recordings to one of his very last ones and to something of a character totally different and also uh, from this inner reflection to the more exterior kind of brilliance that he had. We will hear the finale, or the Presto Non Tanto, from the Chopin B minor Sonata, Opus 58.
since Bruce Hungerford's celebrity was often thought to be principally that of an interpreter of Beethoven, from what we've just heard, it's quite evident that he couldn't be confined in any way to that category. Also, many people find it very difficult to believe that this was the same Bruce Hungerford who was known as an Egyptologist and who had been a fellow of the American Institute in Egypt, who had made many trips to Egypt, and who also was a fabulous photographer. As a matter of fact, Bruce started the piano relatively late for a pianist, 12, which was three years later than my own late start at the age of nine. But prior to all of that, even before the age of nine, Bruce had been interested in Egyptology. He was also interested in paleontology to the point where he got into some pretty good trouble here in Connecticut in 1958 because it appears that there's a part of Connecticut in the valley of the Connecticut River, as a matter of fact. Right near Hartford. Right, which is particularly rich in dinosaur tract fossils. And he and some friends had discovered a very rich cache of these, and they promptly began digging them up to make casts from them, little casts weighing five or six hundred pounds. And so they were actively digging them up and loading them into a station wagon when they were promptly arrested because it appears that it was right close to the Connecticut State Prison. So they were all hauled off to prison <laughs> themselves temporarily until everything was cleared up and the police ended up by helping him load the dinosaur tracks in his car. Oh, you know, by the way, before he went to Europe in 1958, he lived in Larchmont in a little house on an estate and he had dinosaur tracks all over the place and we always referred to it as Dinosaur Haven. <laughs> well, it must be said that Bruce's house in New Rochelle was really something extraordinary, a mixture of music recording, tapes, Egypt artifacts and things. I often thought that it resembled some of the pictures that were taken of the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb <laughs> with its profusion of treasures. Interesting to note, Bruce was born the day Tutankhamun's tomb was opened. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's a marvelous thing. Anyway, he produced this long 17-part series on Egypt with fabulous information. And he was a great speaker, a great raconteur. We have the possibility of playing a short excerpt from a little demonstration record where we'll hear his voice. You'll also have a chance to hear his dry wit. Consider for a moment the evidence for the extreme antiquity of ancient Egypt from the artistic viewpoint. We all know that great art does not suddenly spring up overnight, but is rather the result of hundreds and even thousands of years of development. Here at Saqqara, the necropolis of the ancient city of Memphis in Lower Egypt, is the Step Pyramid. Built 2700 BC at the beginning of the Third Dynasty by King Djoser. The pyramid is surrounded by a great complex of tombs and mortuary temples of astonishing beauty. And this within 400 years of the earliest date in recorded history, and at a time when people in Europe were running around in bear skins. Up until this time, the Egyptians had built almost exclusively with wood, mud brick, and reeds. And as far as is known, King Joseph's Step Pyramid and its complex are the oldest large stone buildings in the world. The builders, working for the first time in this new medium, employed techniques with which they were familiar for mud brick, reeds and wood. In the foreground of this picture is a low wall containing a series of small dummy chapels. And at the entrance to each, translated into stone is a wide open door inviting all who would to enter and worship the God within accessible to all. The nobleman Nefer was the chief of all the musicians at the king's court late in the fifth dynasty around about 2400 BC. 
Here, on a wall of his tomb at Saqqara, cattle are being fed under the eye of an overseer, who does not believe in exertion, at least so far as he himself is concerned. In the upper register on the left, some of Nefer's servants are gathering papyrus in the swamps, tying it into bundles and carrying the bundles over to the right, where they are being tied and glued together to make a coracle. Whether it was his association with Egypt and Egyptology, or if it came about through other sources, I don't know which, Bruce Hungerford was a firm believer in reincarnation. He also had many interests along a mystical line. But I think that Gary Klein can elucidate for us better than I can. Bruce did believe in reincarnation, but I think it's important to mention first that Bruce was a very deep and devoted Christian and a very spiritual man who very much followed what he believed was in the footsteps of the Christ. But he did believe, as did Mr. Edgar Casey, whose works that Bruce Hungerford followed for about 15 years, that our lifetimes were like preparation, that each life was a school and that we went on into other lives and used those things we'd acquired here. In other words, that there was a constant continuation of life in which we were always learning and growing. Well, whatever his beliefs were, I do know that he told me that he meditated two hours every night. He had an internal motivation, an internal force that was really extraordinary and he never seemed to be pushed down by even the most terrible events. He always was strong and had a tremendous physical energy also. His uh, powers of concentration were also extraordinary and he could keep going when the rest of us were all in a state of collapse, both in music, recording, photography, and Egyptology. Along those powers of concentration, uh, one dividend from that was that he had just about total recall of anything that he ever paid attention to. He could come back to you years later and tell you all about it in exact detail. His concentration in music was phenomenal. And when you were at his place for a lesson, the kind of perspiration that would be dripping from you at the end of about 20 minutes working with him was incredible, and he was still going. He was always very kind, would have a stop and have a cup of tea so we could get our forces regathered to go on for another hour. Well, let us get back to music and Bruce Hungerford's musical formation and background. His first professor in Australia was Roy Shepherd, who had been a student of my own professor in Europe, Alfred Corto. After that, Bruce Hungerford studied in Australia with Ignaz Friedman, who at the time was a refugee from Europe. Then, after he came to New York, he encountered Myra Hess, and through her came to uh, another famous pianist. Oh yes, sooner or later there would be one of those fond references to Papa Friedberg. This heritage goes back, therefore, to Brahms, and to Clara Schumann. And so while we're going along those lines, let's go back a little bit farther to Beethoven and to a rare recording of the fourth piano concerto, the first movement only, of Beethoven, recorded in 1965 with the radio orchestra conducted by Takashi Asahino. <laughs>
Speaking of Beethoven, despite certain reports that were printed on the sad occasion of his loss, he did not complete the 32 sonatas of Beethoven. Unfortunately, only 22 were done, three yet to be edited and processed, but should be released before too long. One of the reasons why they weren't completed was because Mr. Hungerford thought that he really only possessed a piece of music if he had learned it, dropped it, and restarted it at least seven times. So this caused quite a lengthy time to go on between recording sessions. But Werner Eisler, perhaps you can elucidate on that. Well, just very briefly, of course, it really took Beethoven a lifetime to create this body of work. And in the same spirit, it was taking Bruce a lifetime to recreate it. Unfortunately, that lifetime was cut short. Gary Klein, having been a student of Mr. Hungerford, can give us a few insights into Hungerford's thinking on this, inasmuch as my own relations with uh, Bruce were that more or less of an equal, and we hadn't occasion to expand on certain reasons for things. We just took them for granted. Gary, what did Bruce say to you? Well, certainly Beethoven was probably Bruce's greatest love as a composer. And he felt that Beethoven reached certain depths of the human spirit that no other composer, perhaps with the exception of Bach, did. But Bruce always stressed the great amount of mind concentration that was needed. And he taught all of his students to keep their mind way ahead as they were working, to always build in the mind. And he thought of Beethoven's works much like a great piece of architecture. I'll never forget going to a lesson one time and playing a few phrases for him. And he said, this is not in one piece. Each piece is like a beautiful brick. But unfortunately, instead of a big church that you should have built, you have a set of closet huts. Bruce was also very fond of Schubert, and let us hear now a few of the waltzes and Landler that he recorded. <laughs> <laughs> 